Uh, okay, so what's going to happen after uh, our last song? Somebody's going to do what? Somebody's going to remind me. Somebody's going to remind me to play a video that will lead into the afternoon uh, Bible study. So remember to do that. Uh, well, this week and next, uh, we're going to look at uh, biblical leadership, more specifically, who is and who ought to occupy the role of leadership in, in kind of an eh, indirect way. Uh, next week, uh, it'll have a bit of an Independence Day twist to it, because Independence Day is coming up. America's not in the Bible, but uh, it'll have an Independence Day uh, twist to it. And, you know, I think the... The, the scriptures from the Exodus uh, into Deuteronomy really parallels uh, the journey of a believer. Because you're, you're leaving the land of bondage. And then partway through that you start complaining. And you want to go back to the life that you lived before. And then uh, you, you declare that you have sinned and you want God's forgiveness. And then you complain again. And then uh, at some point you, you start to feel a little like Korach where you are going, Moses, wait a minute, we're, we're all holy. We don't need you, Moses. And then at some point, as believers, we should come around to the fact that we do need Moses. We do need uh, the Torah. So I was just thinking about that last night as I was struggling to go to sleep after the thunderstorms and stuff, and thinking of how the, the journey kind of parallels that. And if you thought that the uh, intro was worded a little oddly, uh, and you caught that, well, you're correct. It was worded a little, a little oddly. Um, but uh, you'll get it later on. Uh, you know, the person who occupies the role of leadership needs to recognize that he or she serves God our King. Um, and it's extremely important. The book of Numbers tells us about Israel wandering in the wilderness, and they came through the wilderness after leaving Egypt as a result of uh, the lack of faith in God that they would bring them into the promised land. They had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And we also saw last week in the letter to the Hebrews, the encouragement uh, to the persecuted Jewish believers to hang in there and not fall away. That even though they were being persecuted, Yeshua had already prayed the, paid the price of redemption to get the believers into the real promised land, the new Jerusalem. To, and they were to persevere to the end and it'll all turn out okay. We also saw last week in the letter to the Hebrews that we have that encouragement that we know that we are going to make it to the end even though we are under that tremendous persecution. And at the end of Numbers, we find out that all of the events that we read in the book of Numbers uh, were also to shape and mold the people. The events that happen to us are to mold and shape us, and each one of us goes through unique stuff to get to where God wants us to be, and for us to fully recognize that God is our king 24-7, all the time, and that he never sleeps, he never slumbers, he knows what's going on. And Israel, at this point in Numbers chapter 16, is having trouble persevering solely on the covenant made with Abraham and what we call the Mosaic Covenant, they, they're struggling to see God as king and Moses as the prophet or spokesperson on earth. And in the Haftarah, we see the children of Israel were still struggling with this issue when they asked Samuel for a king. And we still struggle with this issue. We have far too many uh, Jewish people who do not see God as king. And we have far too many other people, Christians, who say that they follow Yeshua, the Messiah, and do not see him as king either. I mean, if you thought that you were in the presence of 
uh, God, the Father, and Yeshua, the Messiah, and the recognition of his kingship, and that he was creator of all things, wouldn't you act differently? If he was in the room right now, if he was in every room in your house, would you not act differently? You would be in absolute awe of him, wouldn't you? We act much like Korah and Ibram and Dathan. I, uh, I don't see God. I don't feel God. God must not be here. Sure, God wants us to act a certain way and do certain things, but he's not here. So maybe what we think he wants us to do doesn't really matter. It is as if God exists in an alternate reality when in fact we exist in his reality. In number 16, we find the rebellion of Korach and uh, he is uh, a cousin of Moses who feels that the Levites have gotten the short end of the deal and it's Moses' fault. He makes a couple of valid or semi-valid arguments. Korach uh, asserts that all the people of Israel are priests, uh, especially the Levites, and, and should be able to participate in the priestly responsibilities of Aaron and his sons. Chapter 16, verse 3 says, They assembled against Moses and Aaron. They said to them, You've gone too far. All the community is holy, all of them, and Adonai is with them. Then why do you exalt yourselves about the assembly of Adonai? And he's partly right. Korah's rebellion comes right after the instructions for the Zizits. Uh, one of uh, Korah's assertions is that all the community is holy and Adonai is with them. And that's true in the sense that the children of Israel are chosen or separated under, under service to God. So in that way they're holy. But in the passage about the Zizits in chapter 15... It says in verse 39, it will be your own seat. Uh, so whenever you look at them, you will remember all the mitzvot of Adonai and do them and do not go spying out after your own hearts and your own eyes, prostituting yourselves. This way you will remember and obey all my mitzvot, all my commands, and you will be holy to your God. The seats are to remind the children of Israel to obey all of the commandments, and then you will be holy to your God. Wearing the seats do not make you holy. It is doing God's teachings, being obedient to him that shows your holiness, or being separated from this world to him. Just because I wear seats does not make me a holy person. Korach is making the case that all Israel is being separated unto God, which, is, which holiness is. Yet in the minds and action of the children of Israel, they're not trusting God. At Mount Sinai, they said, we will do and we will obey, but their actions speak otherwise. They complain about God a lot. Korach's other somewhat valid complaint is that because of the unbelief of the ten of twelve spies, the children of Israel will wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and that that is Moses' fault. We didn't cover it last week, but in chapter 13, verse 1, Adonai, it says, Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Send some men on your behalf to investigate the land of Canaan, which I am, bring, uh, which I am giving to Benai Israel, each man. You are to send, will be a prince of the tribe of his fathers, a man from each tribe. And the sense of the Hebrew is, send some men if you want to. And you, you get to choose the men, so long as they are a prince of the tribe. And, and Moses didn't have to send anybody. He could have just trusted in the promise of God. Uh, he chose to send and 10 out of the 12 princes of the tribes that he chose turned out to not believe God's promise that God would bring them into the land. The princes were elected by the tribes. And so Moses chose among the elected leadership of the 12 tribes. And here's a lesson in leadership for you. People don't always elect the right people. We don't always make good choices. 
Scripture does not give us any detail, but we know from what happened that these princes turned spies did not believe God's promises. So in a very real sense, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness was on Moses' shoulder. He picked the spies and sent them out even though he did not need to. The blatantly false accusation leveled by Korach uh, is that Moses and Aaron are the ones who exalted themselves over the assembly of Adonai. In chapter 16, verse 3, it says that, and that's the perception. The reality is, is that God chose Moses. Moses didn't choose Moses. In fact, Moses really tried very, very hard not to be their leader. As we go down in chapter 16, the war of words heats up, and Moses says to Korak, Listen now, sons of Levi, isn't it enough that God, the God of Israel has set you apart from the community of Israel to bring you near to him, to do the work of the tabernacle of Adonai, and to stand before the community to minister to them? The sons of Levi uh, already had a significant role. They were ministering very near to Adonai but in different roles. They had different functions from the priests. And yes, the priests did have the heavy lifting within the tabernacle grounds, and the Levites were more or less assistants. You have to read more about that. Uh, and they were working on the periphery. Still, it was an important role, and one that was appointed by God, and in closer proximity to the tent of meeting than the vast majority of the children of Israel. Yet, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. The work of the Levites didn't seem as glamorous as that of the priests. And, and surely anyone could do the work of the priests. What are you doing? You're chopping up some of the offerings. You're burning some, not others. You're keeping the menorah lit. You burn some incense, and we're good to go. How hard can that be? Verse 16 says, So Moses said to Korak, You and your whole following are to appear before Adonai, you and Aaron, tomorrow. Each man will take his censer, and you are to put incense into them, 250 censers total. You are to present it before Adonai, you and Aaron, each presenting his censer. So each man took his censer, put fire and incense into it, and stood with Moses and Aaron at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And then Adonai shows up. He appears and he tells the people uh, to separate themselves from the other instigators, the Reubenites, Dathan and Ibram, uh, from the tribe of Reuben. Moses says, if God does something new, like open up the ground to swallow them up, then everyone will know that God did that. And guess what God did? God opened up the ground and poof, there we go. The ground opened up, swallowed them, their families and their possessions. And then right after that, fire from God consumed the 250 men of Korak who were at the tent of meeting, consuming the men and their incense because only the sons of Aaron can present incense to God. So God showed his power and his sovereignty. And Korak was not interested, though, in perhaps... Uh, here's the leadership lesson here. that it, Korak wasn't interested in expanding the role of the Levites and, and maybe negotiating that point, having a conversation about how the Levites could serve more. He was interested in having control. Korak was not interested in having a discussion with Moses. He wanted to win. He didn't want to serve, but he wanted to be the leader. The Reubenites, Datham and Ibram, they were not interested in being servant leaders either. As a matter of fact, they weren't even interested in serving. They complained about it, but they didn't want to serve. Twice they say, we will not come. They have no interest in going up and potentially taking over Moses' leadership like uh, Korah does. All they want is to tear into Moses, and yet it's not about Moses. It's about God. They're complaining about God. 
In chapter 16, verse 30, Moses cuts to the chase when he says about the rebelling um, Reubenites. When they go down alive into Sheol, then you will know that these men have despised Adonai. They didn't like Moses and Aaron. They were upset that they didn't enter uh, Canaan, the promised land. And now they're upset because God says they're going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. The bottom line is unbelief and unwillingness to follow God and do what God says. And that's despising God. And it seems harsh. That seems to be too black and white. You know, can't we have a bit of a gray area? But when we say that we don't want to do something that God wants us to do, or we don't think something in Scripture is right, and that has, it has changed because of the times. We're despising God. And if we think of God as king, and he's in, our, in the same room with us, and we're despising him, think of how horrible that is. It'll get more uplifting from here. As much as we'd love to think so, God doesn't offer us citizenship in a democracy. He cannot be shaped and molded into the image that we want him to be. He is king of the universe, and that's all there is to it. And all that you can imagine that to mean. He offers us entrance into the kingdom of God, where the kingdom is ruled by who? Yes, right. Yeah, not a trick question. You'd think that the earth swallowing up people and fire consuming the elected princes from each tribe would be enough to prove Moses' leadership, but it wasn't. The very next day, all the people came out in opposition to Moses. Moses is having a bad time. Verse 44 says, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, get away from among the, this assembly so that I may immediately consume them. So they fell on their faces. And then Moses said to Aaron, take the censer and put it in, in, into, in, take the censer, put into it fire from the altar and put in incense. Get going and hurry to the assembly and make atonement for them because the wrath has come out from God and the plague has started. There was a plague. God sent a plague upon these people because he wanted to consume them immediately. He was tired of their complaining. He was tired of um, their, their total lack of any respect for God. And Moses makes intercession for the people seeking to save their lives. Uh, quite the opposite of asking God to open up the ground and swallowing up the complainers, which was his response from the day before. This time, he's seeking to intercede on the behalf of the people, which actually is the character of Moses, is intercession. And Aaron runs into the middle of the people with the censer of incense, and by that time, 14,700 were already dead of the plague. However, the intercession of Aaron and Moses stopped it. And it was incense, which was symbolizes prayer. They didn't get a vaccine. Just saying. <laughs> I got the vaccine, so I can, I can talk about it. You would think that that would be enough. You've seen in the past couple of days, you've seen the plague, 14,700. You've seen 250 men um, uh, burned up with the, God's fire, his holy fire. And you've seen um, a clan uh, swallowed up after the ground opened up. And you would think that that would jolt the people into seeing the sovereignty of God, our king. Yet it doesn't. And... and it's it said that the whole, the whole idea of recording all of this is so that the people would remember what happened in the past. So that there would be a, a journal, if you will, of how God dealt with the people in the past. And then you jump forward to 1 Samuel in chapter 12, and they still don't get it. 
they don't they still don't get and understand who is king in 1 Samuel chapter 12 the children of Israel see the other nations have kings and now they want a human king they want to be like the nations who had tall good-looking kings and so they got Saul and in frustration Samuel unleashes on the children of Israel Samuel recounts all of the things that God has done for them and in verse 12 it says but when you saw the Hash king of the Ammonites marching against you you said to me no but a king must reign over us even though Adonai your God is your king you think that a human a human being can be a better leader and a better king than God and Samuel is not happy and you get the sense from reading it that he is truly upset so Samuel says the people have done evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord will send rain at the start of the harvest season and verse 12 says is it not a wheat harvest season today I will call to Adonai and he may send thunder and rain then you will know and see that your wickedness is great and that you what you have done in the sight of Adonai by asking for yourself a king and then it rained and it thundered and all the people said to Samuel pray for your servants to Adonai uh, your God that we would not die for we have added to all of our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king then, then when they saw that God validated Samuel's word they recognized that they had sinned by wanting a king other than God when, and when was the last time that you ever heard somebody quote Samuel 1 Samuel 12 19 um, people don't do it we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king be a great campaign sign wouldn't it right next to everybody else's campaign sign and you you put that one up it's not in our vocabulary or list of memory verses to ask that question but it really should be because God created us he breathed life into us and even today relatively few people see him as king and fewer yet experience him as king you and I are somewhere on the spectrum between having an evil heart of disbelief and fully recognizing him as king and I know that this because I know this because the prophets and the Brit Shah explicitly tell us how to be on the right path we need to seek to learn the wisdom of God and apply it to our lives the Bible needs to be read and studied we need to pray and we need to seek God's guidance believers today see God at work and need to comprehend that he is at work just seeing it isn't comprehending that God is at work we are living in a generation where there are plenty of Koraks and Reubenites who despise God and God is looking for us to recognize that these are the birth pangs of the Messiah as trouble increases God's people need to do what Moses did we need to humble ourselves we need to ask for God to intercede as trouble increases the greater we will see God's exaltation we will see him at work we can't fight abortion trafficking and corruption in government and divorce rates that are sky high you name it with we can't do it ourselves we have to cry out to God and when this nation when the world sees that there is only one sovereign King the God of Israel who created all things then the hearts of the people will change and this world will be a better place the only way this world becomes a better place is when people come to faith in Messiah Yeshua and turn their hearts to God and return to God's Word it's not just returning to God you have to return to his word as well 
And here's the good news for believers who have been trusting in human leadership more than they trust in God. Samuel tells the people in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, he says, Fear not. Indeed, you have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following Adonai, but worship Adonai with all your heart. Do not turn aside to go after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are futile. Verse 24 says, Only fear Adonai and worship him in truth with all your heart, considering how magnificently he has dealt with you. And then there's a warning. There's always a warning. Sometimes you have to peel back the label to get to the warning. But the warning says, but if you persist in acting wickedly, you'll be swept away, both you and your king. Follow God. Worship God with all your heart. Worship him in truth. Consider how magnificently he has dealt with you. I don't know about you, but I'm waiting for the return of Yeshua waiting for him to rule and reign on the earth, waiting for him to open the gates of the new Jerusalem. The eyes of all nations need to open up so that we can see God for who he truly is. His kingship has to be unveiled. People need to see that he is king. People need to see that he is king in our lives all the time. It is up to a faithful remnant of believers to unveil the King, Messiah, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The time has come to proclaim the kingdom in such a way that people will see the living God reflected in us. And it's pretty straightforward. Believers need to live like he is king because he is our king. He was king, he is king, and forevermore, he will be king. And may we reflect that. May we show the rest of the world that he truly is our king so that they can see his kingship. So that he's not just out there as some spirit form floating around that we don't have to pay attention to. We want to show that he truly is king. Avedo McKenna, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that there is so much in this week's uh, Parsha that uh, we couldn't even get to. Uh, help us to study it, learn from it. Uh, may the uh, Torah be an anchor to our lives. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. And with the closing blessings, if you'd stand.